sit the throne today. With more backstabbing, dragon eggs, violence, hidden meanings, and passive-aggressive comments, it's safe to say that episode 8 was another strong episode. Chase. Whoops. Sorry, Jason and Luke. That's why we are going to unpack all of the Easter eggs, hidden references, callbacks to Game of Thrones, and changes from the book in this video, and hopefully not start any civil wars in the process. And yes, there will be spoilers in this video. Let's start off with one of the most brutal moments of the show, the death of Vaymond Valerian, who played a little bit too close to the fire in the episode. Now for the most part, this scene is plucked straight out of the books, but there are a couple of differences. Similar to how it is in the show, in the book, Corliss' line of succession is called into question after his health begins to fail, and Vaymond takes the opportunity to insult Rhaenyra's children and their legitimacy. However, unlike in the show, Rhaenyra is the one that calls for Vaymond's head, and Daemon delivers just that before feeding the rest of his body to his dragon, Cyrax. Then, King Viserys orders the removal of Vaemon's cousin's tongues to stop spreading the rumors about Rhaenyra's children. Also fun fact, Vaemon is Corlys' nephew in the book, not his brother. Another slight change from the book is the state of Viserys' health. In the book, he does suffer with ill health, namely gout, which causes him to struggle to ascend the Iron Throne, but this is when things really change. After he orders the removal of Vaemon's cousin's tongues, he falls and cuts his hand on the throne right down to the bone, which soon becomes infected and he is gripped by a fever. However, his health recovers and Rhaenyra returns from Dragonstone and they have a great unifying feast to celebrate this. Unlike the show, where Viserys notes that he is not long for this world and it's essentially his final meal with his family before he kicks the bucket. One reference to the book comes with Alicent's relationship to an ailing King Viserys, which is reminiscent to her relationship with his father, Jaehaerys, as Alicent took care of him on his deathbed, and the old king would often mistake her for one of his own daughters. You probably caught this one, but as the animosity had finally started to fade away after some nice words were shared at King Viserys' feast, after he left, anarchy ensued once again due to more fighting between Aemond and his nephews. During a passive-aggressive speech, Aemond, who is aged like 20 years since we last saw him, is played by Osfrith from The Last Kingdom now, so would you look at that? Not so subtly once again called into question Jace, Luke, and Joffrey's parentage by calling them strong boys over and over again. But you might have missed the slight that started it all off in the first place. As Viserys leaves the dining hall, a roast pig is brought in at the exact same time and placed in front of Aemond, which causes Luke to laugh. The reason he found this so funny was because it was a reference to the prank Aegon and his nephews played on Aemond back in episode 6, where they presented him with a pig with wings, nicknamed the Pink Dread as a joke for his, at the time, lack of having his own dragon. While we have I have mentioned some differences between the book and the show already in this video. The feast scene was almost taken directly from the book, as the two factions did actually share a moment of peace, with even Damon complimenting Otto, who also complimented him in turn, before the night devolves into Aemon's slide on his nephews and Jace dancing with Helena. Speaking of Helena, as well as providing great jokes at her husband Aegon's expense, she was back with another ominous prophecy, uttering the words, You are the beast beneath the lords. Beware the beast beneath the boards. But what does this mean exactly? Well, that's actually unclear, and it could mean multiple things. It could be a reference to Mysaria, aka the White Worm, who we saw scheming away in the shadows. It could be a reference to the upcoming Dance of Dragons, or it could be a reference to one of the most horrific moments in the book, blood and cheese. But we are not going to go in on that, as that would be spoilers. However, going back an entry, do keep an eye, no offense, Eamon, on the prince's simmering tensions with his nephews, and in particular, Damon. So as Game of Thrones takes place over a hundred years after House of the Dragon, other than nods to the Song of Ice and Fire and the Prince that was promised, a moment where Alicent mistakenly thinks Viserys is referring to her son Aegon and the line of succession, there aren't going to be any direct references to the series, but there are some subtle indirect ones. After learning he sexually assaulted one of his chambermaids, Alicent confronts an uncaring Aegon and tells him that he is no son of mine. Now, while this may feel like an exchange that would take place between Joffrey and Cersei, it is actually a reference to a moment between another pair of Lannisters. Yes, I called Joffrey a Lannister, not a Baratheon, and I'm sticking to it. We'll never do it again. As Tyrion confronts his father on the privy, Tywin utters the very same words to Tyrion before his disowned son kills him once and for all. In the episode, we see two forms of tea that you wouldn't want served to you at your local Starbucks, and they both importantly represent character development in the season. The first tea in question is known as the Moon Tea, and is, for lack of a better term, the Westerosi equivalent of the morning after pill, and it is the drink that Allison gives Diana after she was assaulted by Aegon to prevent her bearing an illegitimate child. What makes this even more important is that it shows how far along in the Game of Thrones, as in the game for the throne, not the other show, Alicent is, as she was originally appalled by Rhaenyra taking the tea 
Lady after her fling with Sir Kristen, but is now seemingly less concerned about doling out the tea in order to protect her son's reputation and prevent the line of succession to become even murkier. The second tea in question is the one created from the milk of the poppy, the Westerosi version of morphine, which is used to treat pain, but in large doses can be fatal. King Viserys is shown to be very doped out on the substance, which is making his already ailing mind even more fragile, and has allowed Alicent and her father Otto to rule in his stead. Milk of the poppy was used multiple times in Game of Thrones, such as King Robert after he was left mortally injured by a boar. For the first time in Game of Thrones lore, we saw the process of collecting dragon eggs, and what happens after they are laid in the scene where Daemon is thrilled to learn that Cyrax has laid a clutch of three eggs. Now, while we won't go into the specifics, those dragon eggs will be very important moving forward, as not only does it give the Black Faction three more dragons, but one of them will likely become the Dragon Morning, who plays an important part in the story moving forward, but we will not go into further detail than that. After the name slip in the previous episode, with Viserys calling Alicent Emma, Alicent makes one of her own. As she speaks to a knight of the Kingsguard, she mistakenly calls them Sir Arik, before he corrects her that it's actually Eric. But this isn't just her getting his name wrong, it's actually an introduction to the Cargills, Arik and Eric, who are identical twins and both members of the Kingsguard. What makes this even more important is that the twins find themselves on opposing sides during the infamous Dance of the Dragons. Speaking of those factions, the green and black colors were seen throughout the episode with Alicent and Otto wearing green while Rhaenyra and her children were dressed in black. But there was another character importantly wearing black, Rhaenys. Before King Viserys made his dramatic entrance, it seemed like Rhaenys would side with the High Towers, assuming they would strike the first major blow on Rhaenyra and her children's claim to the throne. But after Viserys' arrival, she makes a pivot to side with Rhaenyra, betrothing her grandchildren to Rhaenyra's sons and becoming a major player for the Black Faction. Also, it's worth mentioning mentioning that the only person who went to meet Rhaenyra and Daemon was Lord Caswell, which is not only a subtle slight by Otto, but shows us how little allies Rhaenyra currently has in King's Landing. As we saw in the episode, Jace is taking his role as the eventual heir to the throne very seriously, and with his legitimacy in question, he is noticeably insecure about his claim, so he is desperately trying to learn High Valerian in order to prove himself as a true descendant of House Targaryen and Valerian. But the lines of High Valerian that he is learning also act as a Westerosi history lesson, as he recounts the moment Aegon the Conqueror first landed in the Seven Kingdoms, reaching the Blackwater Rush unopposed, which would later become the city of King's Landing, and building the Aegonfort. Speaking of Aegon's conquest, in order to unify the Seven Kingdoms and become accepted as king, he disavowed the Old Gods and converted to the Faith of the Seven, although the Targaryens still maintain and meet at the Godswood, such as Rhaenyra and Rhaenys, showing their links to the Old Gods are still there. On the other side of the coin though, Alicent is showing her devotion to the Faith of the Seven, decorating the Red Keep with a seven-pointed star and wearing one proudly, all of which once again shows the deep divide between the two factions. As we know, six years have passed since Episode 7 and Episode 8, and Rhaenyra and Daemon have been busy in that time, marrying and having two sons of their own. The pair introduced their sons to Viserys, and us, saying their names are Aegon and Viserys. Now, while these are typical Targaryen names, they are very important for multiple reasons. Firstly, calling their son Aegon is definitely a slight at Alicent, naming her son Aegon, but it is also a reference to Viserys and Daemon's older brother Aegon, who was originally destined for the throne before he died, which makes Varys' second son lying to Vaymond even more ironic. Also, I really want to go into the hidden meaning behind Viserys' line of that's a name fit for a king, but that unfortunately would be spoilers, so I will go no further. Another form of conflict between the Blacks and the Green is their links to the Maesters. For example, when it's revealed the Maesters have been helping with Viserys' health on the orders of Alicent, Rhaenyra and Daemon scoff that of course the Maesters have been helping them. The reason they do this is because House Hightower has a long history with them. In fact, one of the titles that comes with being Lord of Hightower is Defender or Protector of the Citadel, and the house has actually been long established as a patron of the Order of Maesters. The Hightowers even helped found the Citadel, and it's funded by Old Town Taxes, which, yes, run through the high towers as well, so you can understand why Damon and Rhaenyra are skeptical of them. One of the most eye-catching features in Episode 8 is Viserys' mask, which makes him look like he's about to abduct a girl named Christine and flee to the depths of the Opera House. And, like most plot points in House of the Dragons and Game of Thrones, has a link to real-life history. Viserys' illness is likely leprosy, which has severely disfigured his face and caused him to lose an eye. This connects him to King Baldwin IV, who served as King of Jerusalem from 1174 to 1185, and like Viserys, ruled while having the disease, leading him to become known as the Leper King and 
and was left blind by it. However, while in imagery, the king is depicted as wearing a silver mask similar to the one supported by Viserys, there is actually no physical evidence to suggest he did in fact wear one. And finally, this is actually some early season trivia. But while we don't see Viserys and Allison tying the knot in the show, their wedding was actually filmed. However, it seemingly didn't make it off the cutting room floor due to time constraints. So, what did you make of this video? Any we missed? What has been your favorite episode so far? Let us know in the comments below and make sure to subscribe to the channel today for all this and more.